Today I want to tell you a little bit about the power of Jesus to transform the lives. It's a personal story because it's the reason I'm standing here today. Uh, this was not my career plan. See, this was not what I intended to do when I was growing up, going through high school, or even when I was planning for college. It uh, wasn't part of my career opportunity. Don't get me wrong, I mean, I, I knew about Jesus. I'd even been baptized. I told you last week I was going to tell you a little bit more about myself today. So, uh, ready or not, here it comes, right? You know, we have to hear this. Okay, well, maybe, was, you know, I grew up in a small town in uh, in Ohio, Girard, Ohio. My dad worked for a subsidiary of General Motors. My mom worked wherever they would give her an apron and a schedule. And uh, we lived on a, a small farm of about two and a half acres. That's just enough for a few 4-H animals and a garden to uh, subsidize our food budget. My two sisters, uh, one older, one younger, they had to push me in the middle. Uh, we, we went to church every Sunday with our parents at the first Christian church of Girard, Ohio. And as the custom of that denomination, uh, when we were 12, each of us in turn went through a little class and was baptized. I remember thinking at that time, when I was baptized, well, Jesus died to save the world. I knew that part. I knew for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So I knew Jesus died to save the world. That's why we came every week to worship him. And I figured I was part of the world, so that must have meant he died to save me. But that's about as attached as I was. So I was, in my mind at least, a Christian. Now I think it was a, a sort of Christian. Some would call it a nominal Christian, a Christian in name only. I had good morals. I, I call myself a Christian more than anything else. I certainly wouldn't call myself a, an atheist or a Buddhist or anything else. So I must have been... A Christian. I had Bible verses memorized as I just shared. And of course, I had a suit to wear special occasions, so that was nice. But that was about it. And when I was 14, my dad was transferred to Baltimore. Actually, when I was 13, transferred to Baltimore to work at General Motors. We moved to Maryland. We moved to Forest Park, Maryland, up in Hartford County. And then my parents divorced. And my Christianity was just something that I used to do. It was a part of my history and my upbringing, but not a part of my life. I hope none of you understand that part of the story, but maybe you know some people like that. They were grown up that way, and then church was something that they used to do. That was the beginning of my last years. No movie about it, but, you know, it wasn't a good time for me. I didn't even know I was lost, but I needed mercy. I needed Jesus, and for some reasons, my family had broken up. I had moved actually three times within a couple of years. I changed schools four times, and I was a 14-year-old boy, so I was all alone. I needed mercy. I needed, I needed Jesus. It reminds me of an incident in the Bible. I'm going to stop there and get to the Bible, then I'll come back to my story, so you have to hold on for the rest. My in the Bible about a man who needed mercy, who needed an encounter with Jesus. Circumstances are certainly different. I don't think he grew up the same way I did, but the, the need was the same. The need for mercy. And we find the story in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. If you have your Bibles you want to follow along with me, you'll see at the end why I'm using this story to tell my story. At least I hope you will. Jesus and his disciples were on the way to Jerusalem. They were on the way to his final destination. He was headed to Jerusalem knowing he was going to die. The disciples, just before the passage we're about to read, had been jockeying for position. Jesus had been telling them the Son of Man was going to be going to Jerusalem and be crucified. And they didn't quite understand. So the disciples were jockeying for position, thinking he was going to, you know, overthrow Jerusalem would become king. He would be first. 
the second, James and John said, Jesus told them, Look, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for men. That's Mark 10 45. So if you could right there in verse 46, if you have your Bibles open, I'm reading from the New International Version, which I think is what the few Bibles are, so we're trying, trying to be in sync here. Okay. It says, uh, Then they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, who was the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. Now, then, just as now, it was not uncommon to see people begging at major crossroads and intersections, especially in Israel. For people who had been instructed on the need to care for widows and orphans was part of their, their heritage. They knew that that was what the Old Testament said to care for those in need. And so they affirmed those with disabilities, the disenfranchised, that they could not work to earn money, so they would rely on the charity and generosity of others. And so the blind beggar had chosen perhaps this to be the favorite spot right outside the city of Jericho on the way to Jerusalem. He knew people that were passing by that were going to go to worship. So, because uh, Jerusalem and Jericho were about, I'd say about 10 miles so it was a major road. And so they'd be like, he, he was like, if you're on your way, what if don't forget me in need? They sat there begging. People in town had seen him all the time and they sort of knew him. I said, it's sort of him because he was called Bartimaeus, which is the son of Timaeus. That was Timaeus' son. He might have had another name. We don't know. All they knew was, oh, that's Timaeus' son. That's what they called him. Called him by his father. By, didn't call him his own name. That's the blind boy, son of Timaeus. The one who sits at the roadside begging. As he sat there begging a large crowd, it's a certain created quite a commotion that even a blind man could tell was passing through. And even though he could not see, he heard it as verse 47 records. It says, When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And I said to do this the way I'd like to do it, I had the microphone on, and it was scary. Because I used to shout that, because that's what's amazing. He shouted, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. I mean, it had to be loud because it was a crowd. There was a commotion. He had to make sure Jesus heard him because he didn't want to miss his opportunity to connect with Jesus. I mean, this wasn't just anybody passing by. This was Jesus. And how he refers to Jesus is amazing. A Bartimaeus, although he was blind according to the world, he was able to recognize far more than eyes could see. He heard that this crowd was following Jesus of Nazareth. He had no doubt heard the reports of healing. He had no doubt heard the reports of miracles that Jesus was doing. He no doubt heard the reports of the teaching of the speaking uh, with authority that the Pharisees didn't have. He heard about the altercations with the Pharisees and the religious people telling them what they were doing wrong. Could you believe that? Although he could not see, he did not let his visual impairment affect what he could know about Jesus. And he knew that this man was not simply a carpenter's son from Nazareth, but he knew that this man was the son of David. Just as Bartimaeus was recognized as the son of Timaeus, he recognized Jesus as the son of David. Now don't get confused, he knows he's from Nazareth, so he knows who his earthly father is. But he calls them by a name to say, I recognize who you are. Son of David. This is a prophetic term. This is a term reserved for the Messiah. This is the only time in the Gospel of Mark that this term is used. This blind man knows Jesus is the Messiah. No one told him, but he knew. This is a, an important revelation. Jesus, by earthly standards, of course, we grew up in Joseph's house. We know that he was obviously the Son of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the 
Bartimaeus, as our Father's Creed says. But Bartimaeus recognizes him as the son of David, the Messiah, the one who was promised to be on the throne, the one who would deliver Israel, the one who would make change in the world forever for good, the one who was promised from God, finally here and passing him by. And Bartimaeus says, no, don't pass me by. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Interesting. His trust for mercy. Mercy. Mercy is it's not us. Mercy is not something that we deserve. Mercy is not something that we can obtain. You can't get mercy. It has to be given. Mercy is an interesting thing. It's like grace, but not quite the same. Grace is unmerited favor. It's simply goodness that is shown to you that you don't deserve. And praise God, He gives amazing grace to us all. Amen. He gives us unmerited favor, kindness. But mercy is something different. Mercy is something when someone has power and authority over you and they can do something to you and they choose not to. That's mercy. And here Bartimaeus, uh, he couldn't have let Jesus pass by, but instead he calls out to Jesus and says, have mercy on me, because he knew that Jesus was the Messiah. But God in the flesh, he knew when he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He said, Jesus, Messiah, I need you. I need you, and I want you to consider me. Please show me kindness that I do not deserve, but that you have power to give. Have mercy on me. The crowd wasn't impressed. <laughs> the crowd see this blind man sitting on the side of the road, just out like a fool in their mind. This is what he's doing. He's a He's doing miracles. He's doing all kinds of things. He's walking by and you're yelling at him. Pipe down. The man's son. Pipe down. They were annoyed. So it's 48. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. And so, of course, he cried. Right? No, no. He shouted all the more, it says. Son of David, have mercy on me. He's not going to let the crowd stop him. He's, he's got a chance. He's got an opportunity for, for the presence of God to, to come close to and, and have a connection. He's, I'm not going to miss this because you tell him to be quiet. You ignore me all the time, he probably thinks. That he, how many times they walk past him, and a couple times they might drop him. So, you. But Jesus, how many times has he walked by? As far as we know, this is the only time. Lord, I, mean, I don't want you to pass by. What are I going to do to get your attention? I'll shout. I'll make a fool of myself. But I don't want to miss you. See, Bartimaeus wasn't called out to the crowd. He didn't care what the crowd said. He wasn't asking the crowd for anything. The only person who was trying to get his attention was Jesus. The only person he really cared about at that time was the Messiah. And he was willing to go all out for this opportunity. In the words, he says, Son of David, have mercy on me. I mentioned those as a minute ago because it's clearly in the text. It's interesting that this verse is actually uh, the beginnings of one of the most important prayers in Orthodox and Catholic theology. And it's called the, the Jesus Prayer. It's a simple prayer. Probably the simplest of all prayers. And the prayer is this. Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So that is just a few things, change a, a few things, but it's the basis of what Bartimaeus said. Because it's believed that this simple prayer said sincerely, prayed sincerely, is the key to opening your heart to receive salvation. Because this prayer recognizes and declares some things. It declares your faith in what Jesus is. Bartimaeus had faith that Jesus was not just a man from Nazareth. 
pretty good at that. You say, you're the Son of God. You put yourself in the right relationship. You know who God is. And then you ask for mercy because you know that God is the only one that can show us the mercy we need. And then in the prayer, you recognize you are perfect with God. You are, and we are, and I am. Sinners. And as sinners, what we need more than anything else is mercy. Because as sinners... We don't deserve anything from God. But the good news is God has mercy for us. I don't know if you heard me. I said the good news is God has mercy for us. Hallelujah. This prayer declares through faith who Jesus is, what our station in life is, and our reliance on God for His kindness. And so if we can pray this prayer earnestly, we can allow our hearts to open up for God to step in. And that's what God wants to do. I hope you understand that. God wants to step in. He wants to show you mercy. Just as Bartimaeus was crying out in the crowd, like, shut, shut up, be quiet. I shouldn't say shut up. They said, be quiet, pipe down. But verse 49, Jesus. Verse 49 says, Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man. And I love you. They called the blind man. Show up on your feet. He's calling you. Like, come on, crowd. You can't fool nobody. But see, Jesus does not pass by those who call on him in faith. He will not hear you crying and just walk on by as though it doesn't matter. He's not going to do it. If you call out and faith to him, he's going to stop, turn around, and say, let's talk. Let's have a talk. That's the God that I serve. Because he came to love people. He came to connect with people. He came to care and to show us how much he wants us. He came to fix what we broke. A relationship with God. So though others dismissed Bartimaeus, Jesus calls him. And the response is dramatic. But just throwing his cloak aside. It says, he jumped to his feet and came to see Jesus. I wonder if he stumbled because he couldn't see. It doesn't matter. He threw his cloak aside and stumbled, jumped, ran, whatever he had to do to get to Jesus. This is my chance. This is what I need. Hallelujah. He was willing to leave everything. The cloak, that's probably all he had. He just goes inside. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I have. I'm going to what I need. Verse 51. What do you want me to do for you? And Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Now Jesus knows what the man needs. I think, of course, he knows the man's blind. He sees him sitting there, but he knows that. But notice what respect him. In order for him to maintain dignity, he does not presume what the man wants or needs. He doesn't just, the man comes to him and Jesus heals him. He needs Bartimaeus to say what he needs. See, Jesus doesn't just presume anything. He wants us to come to him asking for forgiveness, asking for what we need, asking for healing, asking for him to give us the mercy and grace we need. He's not going to do it because he can't, because he wants us to recognize our dependence on him, and he wants to give us the desires of our hearts. What do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus was asking for mercy. He was asking Jesus to whatever you're willing to do. But Jesus turned it around and said, instead of what I'm willing to do, I'm going to ask you what you would like me to do. I think that's awesome. And the man said, I want to see. It's ironic in some ways because this blind man was the only one in the whole gospel who actually did see. He's the only one who already saw. He's the only one who knew who Jesus was. Everyone else followed him around like puppies, maybe, just, you know, following around. But this man, without being having any eyes to see, 
to see what far beyond I can test. I want to see. In some ways, he was seeing all along. Nevertheless, see this response in verse 42, or 52. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he was pleased to sight and followed Jesus along the road. Your faith has healed you. What faith? The faith that he revealed when he prayed to Jesus' prayer. The faith that he revealed when he recognized Jesus as the Messiah. The faith that he revealed when he said, have mercy on me. You wouldn't say have mercy on me to just anybody walking by, but only on somebody you didn't have the power to do something. He revealed his faith in that one statement. Son of David, have mercy on me. And he said, that faith is all you need. You're healed. That's how I found myself in this story. As I said, I was lost. I was in need of mercy. And from age 14 through 18, you know what you believe are? Those are high school years. Those are the worst years to be lost. I don't know, maybe college is worse, but look at the head that because something dramatic happened to me my freshman year in college. I uh, turned those years. When I was 16, I got a job at Wendy's in Edgewood. I like Wendy's. But uh, the most important part of the story that happened at Wendy's was I met this girl. <laughs> you know the girl, right? A girl named Diane Stanley. Uh, so we worked together at Wendy's, and that was kind of sweet on her, you know? Uh, but she kept rebuffing my advances. Can you believe that? <laughs> Don't be so stupid, Bernie. Come on, man. But she rebuffed my advances because she was a born-again Christian. And I didn't know what that was, but I was kind of taken aback. I said, I'm a Christian. I was baptized when I was 12. I used to go to church. That makes me a Christian, right? I used to. I hadn't been to church since I was 14. But, you know, I used to go to church. That kind of counts. Well, she looked at my life and how I was living and the words I would say, the jokes I would make. My activities, my hobbies, and concluded rightly that Christian was just something I was adding to my name to help to woo her. There was no Christianity in my life, except as a past thing. Nonetheless, we were friends. She was nice enough to be friends and friends with me. And uh, as I went off to college, as the to Drexel University, majoring in computer science, can you believe that? She made a, a tape of her favorite Christian songs. And at the time, I was in a punk band, and uh, these were not my style of music. Um, they didn't have too many Christian punk songs back in, in the mid-80s. But because I liked her, I listened to the tape. And when I got to Drexel, they had a, a club day, you know, where all the clubs have uh, tables out and everybody gets to sign up. And so they had a club day, and I saw a flyer for the Drexel Christian Fellowship. And I thought, this would be a good way for me to bolster my resume, which I am. If I go to this Christian Fellowship, then she's going to think, maybe she is a Christian, but I might still have a shot, you know, to hold that hope. So I went to the Christian Fellowship, and what I saw blew my mind. I saw people my age, 18 to 22, raising their hands, closing their eyes, singing praises to a God they knew. I didn't even really know God. I thought God was something you talked about, something you sang about, something you might read about, but not something you could actually know. But they were singing songs to somebody they loved. They were in a relationship. And I had been looking for love. I had been looking for love. I thought maybe Diane could be it. She wasn't. But what I found was something very better, more powerful, more real. I've never seen anything like it. 
But I decided to go back to this Christian fellowship. But I'm running every week on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. And I began to open my Bible. Yes, I did have one. And I read it. And I decided I should know more about what they were talking about. So I started to read in the Gospel of Matthew. And I began reading more or less every day. I can't promise it was every day. But I began reading. And I was amazed at Jesus. I was reading about the stories you read in Sunday school about David and Goliath and Noah and the ark. And that's not what I was reading. I was reading about Jesus who interacted with people, who healed people, who cared for people. It was tremendous. As college progressed my freshman year, things got tough. And on one day, October 14th, 1987, I had a particularly tough day. Uh, I won't go into the details, but uh, it was not a good day for me. And so as I got back to my room at the end of the day, I got in my bed and put on my you made for me a mystery, so to speak. And I played the, the song, and one song came on by Benny Hester. A song that I knew you all had heard. Because it was played. The song that says, Nobody knows me like you. And I had always sang it when I heard it, thinking of, of Diane, thinking of a friendship song, you know, uh, maybe a love song about deep friendship, and I would always think about Diane. But then as I listened that day, I heard these words. They shook me. In the second verse, it says, All of my thoughts, yes, you know them well, and you've never turned me away. And I thought, wait a minute. I would never let Diane know all my thoughts. I'm trying to get her to like me. How could anybody know all my thoughts? And never turn me away. How could anybody know the deepest, ugliest stuff in my life and still love me? I had a hard enough time with that as it is. How could anybody else do that? And then I realized for the first time the song wasn't about a friendship, it certainly wasn't about a, a, a love relationship that we normally think of, but it was about God, it was about Jesus. And when I recognized that, I started crying. I started bawling, if I can say that. And I rewound the tape, and I sang it for the first time to Jesus. And I felt as though the weight of the world was cast off my shoulders because I recognized that Jesus was the one who really loved me. And I prayed that Jesus would come into my heart and come into my life and change me. And my life has never been the same. October 14th, 1987. I never got with that. She married and moved away. But what she gave me was far better than anything she else she could have given me. She gave me an opportunity to have an eternal life with Jesus. And what part of me I felt like my eyes were open that day as I could see Jesus. And he could truly give me the mercy that I needed. And so as the passage concludes, it says Bartimaeus immediately followed Jesus along the way. And so I immediately followed him along the way, never looking back. I hesitated telling you the story today for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's far too focused on me to be of much value to you, but I hope but in the context of the Scripture, you can see that sometimes the Scripture can come alive. Bartimaeus, which I've chosen as my spiritual name, uh, because that's kind of how it feels. For some reason, I was blind and broken, looking for something, and I wasn't even sure what it was. And when I had the opportunity to meet Jesus, I grabbed a hold of it. But secondly, sometimes, I was afraid to tell you, but sometimes when I tell it, at least people thinking, well, I didn't have a big dramatic experience for my salvation, maybe... Maybe there's something wrong with me, but I, I don't want to. Don't, I don't want to think that. Okay. Because some may think uh, I never had a come to Jesus moment. Well, my testimony isn't like Paul's. I didn't have like the actual scale falling off my head. It wasn't that kind of thing. But it's just the testimony of a, a day I realized that I needed Jesus, and I accepted His gift of mercy and chose to follow Him. 
And you might not be able to remember what day it was, like I just told you that it was for me. But as long as you can say that you have chosen to follow Jesus, that you know you need Jesus, and you are following him along the way, then your testimony is just as good and just as valid, maybe even better than you. Perhaps you never had the lost years. And it says, I am grateful for that. I wish I could have that. The important thing is that each of us has an opportunity to make a decision to follow Jesus. And when that opportunity comes, that we make it. That we say, I want the mercy of God. I want to know Jesus as my Savior. Today, there may be some of you who would still think, I, I, I'd like to have Jesus as my best friend. I'd like to have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'd like to know Jesus like that. And if that's you today, in a few moments, I'm going to sing a song. I want you to come to the altar and pray. I'll pray with you because I know what it's like to have that. I don't want you to miss this opportunity to meet Jesus. Do not let him pass by without receiving his mercy. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the way you truly have mercy, the way you love us so completely, the way you know everything about us and want to hug and hold us. We thank you for your death on the cross that would forgive us of all our sins. We thank you for the resurrection from the grave that declares you have power of life and death. And we thank you, most importantly, that you have come that we might have eternal life through faith in you. So, Lord, meet with us today. In Jesus' name, amen.